The Holy Gospel according to St. John, beginning with the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd, does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because the hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Pastor sent me a sermon written by John Bright in the Northwest Ser Seminary Chapel. And it, it's about the 23rd Psalm. Now we have just read together the 23rd Psalm and that is surely one of the best beloved passages in the entire Old Testament and one of the most familiar. If you'd been asked to repeat it together all could have done so, young and old, with one voice, without stopping. And what's more, the psalm is a passage that occasions the Christian no theological difficulty whatever. Let us admit that some Old Testament passages do, but not the 23rd Psalm. Here is no difficulty at all. Christ himself could have said these words. Here we see a faith and a piety so elevated that that we see at once that it could be a model for our faith journey and our piety. One has only to substitute for the Lord is my shepherd, Christ is my shepherd, and the psalm is caught up at once into a Christian context and becomes a word of God for the church and for each of us. But how are we to hear this word? What is it trying to say to us? Is it an, ex is it an example that we ought to follow? Yes, it is that. Our faith and our piety ought to be like that of the psalmist. But one thinks that it is not what it is primarily trying to say. It says that, but it says much more than that. It is a word, one thinks, which rightly heard speaks not of my piety, but of Christ. It does this first of all, in that it is a word that points to Christ. Now you say, how can this be so? The psalm does not prophesy of Christ. It is not a prophecy at all. It is a description of the faith of the psalmist in the God of Israel, centuries before Christ. And yet, though it does not mention Christ, even indirectly, it does in a real sense point to him. And the more seriously we read it, the clearer that becomes. You see, the key words are the first words. The Lord is my shepherd. These words give meaning to the whole psalm. Without them, the psalm makes no sense. It wouldn't have even been said. Can you imagine the psalmist saying, I need no shepherd, for I want nothing? I lie down in green pastures and walk beside quiet waters, and my soul is refreshed. I follow in paths of righteousness, for I have my ideals. And even in the dark valley, I will fear no evil, for I have learned to be brave. No, that would be a mockery, a travesty of the psalm. The assurance of the psalmist is the assurance of one who has found and knows his shepherd, his God. One who does not know his shepherd cannot say this psalm. The psalm therefore points to the shepherd and the New Testament tells us that the true shepherd, the good shepherd, is Jesus Christ. And so the psalm becomes a word for us today. It points them to Christ for it points them to the peace they do much desire. All over the world, of course, people yearn for peace. We don't live in a peaceful world. We have no idea how to produce one. Probably in our lifetimes, we will never see anything 
properly called peace. And our individual lives are not altogether peaceful either. Life's a struggle that consumes us, forever getting and spending and wanting and not getting. And if we achieve it in a moment's armistice, pain, disease, or death can upset it. And we have no recourse. How we wish we had a peace like the psalmist. Peace in the midst of one's life struggles and ain't danger. Peace through every possible contingency. Peace sufficient for all things. Peace that endures forever. The psalm is then is a window into our desire. What would we not give to have peace of this kind? How we cry for some shepherd to give it, and what a lot of other shepherds we have followed in the attempt to obtain it. So the psalm speaks to our desires and it speaks a word. You want this peace? You wish you could say these words? Well, you can't th say them until you say, the Lord is my shepherd, Christ is my shepherd. Until you say that, your dreams of peace remain a mirage. As long as you seek peace by surrounding yourself with things, by the good deeds you do, or by political or economic programs secure the world, or by flight from this world, you will never have it. Until you find your shepherd, your God, the words of this psalm remain ever strange words to you. So the psalm, in a real sense, points to Christ. It points to him because it points to peace and he is the giver of peace. It points to him because he is the good shepherd, as the New Testament repeatedly tells us so. So then the psalm is a word that points to Christ, but it's also a word to all in Christ, to us who are Christians, who all who are members of Christ's church. And oh yes, obviously you say it is. It is a model for our faith and piety. That is what our piety ought to look like. I should so live that the word, word of the psalmist becomes my word. Christ is my shepherd, I shall not want. Christ satisfies my every need. He creates righteousness in me. He leads me in the dark valley and confronts my distress. To him I entrust my future, desiring no benefits save fellowship with him forevermore. So says the psalmist. So I ought to say, let this be an example of your piety. Praise God that he has given us his true shepherd. Trust him as the psalmist trusted his God. So says the psalmist. So should I say. Finish? Finish? Oh no, not begun. The psalm is a model to our piety, and yet it is more than that. You see, the words are in the first person. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The more seriously I take those words, the more clearly I see that they are not my words. They are not the words I would normally say. If I do, I do not really mean them. The psalm is a model for my piety indeed, but it is not a photograph of my piety. It outruns me, it lies beyond. It is precisely a piety that I have not got, or at best have partly, occasionally, made, that I grasp only to see it slip through my fingers. No, these are not my usual words. The model for my piety is also the despair of my piety. So, pastor, tell me how to get this piety. Have you got it yourself? What should I do? Some technique of worship and devotion, matins, vesper, reading daily from the word, regular attendance at church, all this I have done from my youth. What then, have more faith? How does one go about creating more faith? By tugging at one's spiritual bootstraps. No, pastor, committed to Christ I am, but this piety, this peace that so often eludes me, so the psalm is a model for my piety, judges my piety. The sickly, sweet, pseudo-piety that is the age sentiment but knows nothing of life's battles. This faith, which is faith because it does not ask any questions. This trust is... Oh. There we go. This trust, which is trust because it has never seen the dark valley, but in the dark valley turns tail and runs. And so at last I see the psalm, not as a description of what I should have and be, but as a description of what I don't have and don't know how to get. I cannot read it just as an example, though it is that. It tells me that piety, God's peace, is nothing that I can have as a possession. It is something 
that is given to me in Christ, possessed in Christ, but is not my possession. It is the gift of God given freely that I may know that it is a gift and praise his name. And so the Psalm, I think, read so, places me in the proper posture of my Lord, praising him for his gifts, humbly dependent upon his grace. Perhaps then I will understand the meaning of the text, by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourself. It is the gift of God. Amen.